Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. Well, it's a go. The regatta will be going ahead this year, and although it's not its same old self, we're happy to see it back. Yeah, we're keeping it up with both guys. We're good, we're good. We got it, we got it. Catch, yes. Catch, yes. For many of us, we've grown up around the pond for that special Wednesday in August, winning teddy bears and eating some not so healthy food, but good all the same. Later in life, we may have played regatta roulette, hoping our meteorologist called it right. And for many, and I'm fortunate to include myself in this group, it's a day you work the whole summer for, and for the best teams out there, it's a day you work the whole year for. The Royal St. John's Regatta is the oldest organized sporting event in North America. It's been a part of Newfoundland history for over 200 years. The first record of an organized event was in 1816, but rowing matches were common among ships crews in St. John's Harbor since at least the 1700s. Sometimes the regatta would draw up to 50,000 people to the shores of Kitty Vitty Lake, and it's widely known as the largest garden party in the world. That is, when the world is normal. Although the format has changed this year, where the event will be televised and individuals are being told not to come down to watch in person due to the pandemic, we still get to see our friends, family, and neighbors out there for one last spin of the pond. Well, today we have some very well-known rowers in our community. First is Campbell Fien, who was part of the Outer Cove, Middle Cove, Logie Bay crew that restored the record to the area in 1982 after their community's long-standing record was broken in 1981. He's been active in the sport ever since, commentating the regatta and sitting in the regatta committee as well. We'll then chat with James and Dan Cadigan, both seasoned rowers in the regatta, and James holds the honor of being part of the 2007 crew that set the record that currently stands today. Let's check out our conversation with Campbell and learn everything we need to know about the sport of rowing and the Royal St. John's Regatta. Hey, Campbell, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's great to have you on. We're talking about the regatta today, and I've known you for a long time. And ever since I've known you, my memory of you is you're associated with the regatta. What's your role with them now? I've been on the regatta committee now probably for eight, nine years, probably. And right this year, I took on a new role for um, boathouse planning director of the boathouse. So basically in charge of the boathouse, making sure that the lights are on, basically. The boats are out, they're clean, they're, they're in working order. Staff underneath us, making sure that the working hours are good and the boat, the boats themselves are most important that they're actually in good condition and make sure that everything is set up for for the uh, regatta and the rowers itself, so, and plus the other races that we have. Right, and that's a big responsibility this year, of course, of cleaning and getting the boats prepped between crews going out. So. Yeah, unfortunately, that's um, that's the that's the new way of doing things now. You you know you want to you want to make sure that everything is sanitized and we take out all the boats out, we sanitize them in between spins and our races and make sure that the next boat is clean for the next set of next set of people to come in on the boat so well that's great i mean this is great news then the city announced that there's going to be a race this year i know you've been involved for a good chunk of your life give the folks a bit of a history on the event so they can understand just how important it is to what what we do here in the town well it's you know it's, a, it's the only provincial holiday that the province have you know it's um it's been ongoing for 204 years now i guess and it's a big event in the city. It's probably the largest gathering that, that we have in the city itself and, and, and the province. You know, you're talking 30, 40,000 people. And, and um, you know, you got your garden party and you got people that come down for, you know, to win a teddy bear, buy fries years and years and years ago. And blind before my time, you know, climbing the greasy pole. And you know, there was all kinds of nostalgia things that went down at the regatta. And plus the regatta itself, the rowers. I mean, the rowers are setting, setting new times down. You know, there was a... A long-standing time with the article of fishing in 903, and then Stockley broke that in 81, and then we broke it in 82, and then onward she went. You know, she just kept on going. So there's a lot of stuff that goes down on the pond, starting literally in October now, years and years ago when I started rowing, when you start rowing, the boats come out. But yeah. now the training has changed, and all that stuff is done. So it's a big difference now compared to when we started. Yeah, and I want to talk to you about some of that training that you've had. What's your first memory of the event itself? Was it rowing or just attending as a kid? Uh, yeah, well, obviously attending as a kid. I mean, you know, we, um, my, my parents were big supporters of the regatta. We had really good friends that were been on the regatta committee for, for years. So when I was 10 or 11 years old, I got asked if you wanted to go row in the regatta. And I was like, yes, why wouldn't I? Because I mean, that child 
getting that teddy bear and getting them fries. And I remember uh, when the police wanted championship brace, and, and I believe they wanted that year. And I remember my mom jumping up and down because the police wanted them. My dad didn't roll, but my uncle did, my Uncle Jerry. And, um, you know, so that was exciting times. And I'd see the excitement in, in everyone's face. And, of course, I started rolling in 1975. I was 10, 11 years old. And, and uh, you know, I remember winning our first race and now nah, where we went. And I just remember the excitement in my family and my parents. And my brother wrote me at the time. It was a good ride. It was just uh, just the fun and the joy. And then you quickly realize that, my God, I'm almost in shape. Like this, this is not just, uh, uh, you know, we didn't work out back then. We we just basically, like I said, the boat showed up in May and we jumped in the boat with a pair of uh, blue jeans on and cordial boots and went rowing, you know, and then that evolved to what it is today. So how many years did you compete in the race and what were some of the highlights? Because you guys did break a record. Well, we broke several records, Mike, yeah. um, and sort of other crews since us. But back in the early 80s, we broke, like I said, Stockley Road in 81, broke the Autocove record, the Fishman, and we took it back the next year. So that was 82. So we rode 903, and, and that stood a time for a little while. Then I actually broke my own record when I rode with the police in 89 and uh, rode nine minutes flat. We were the first crew unofficially, and I'll say that, unofficially to row under nine. For three years in a row, and but we'd never done it regatta day. It was until out of call Stockley done it in '91, and they done it in style, of course. New boats, new this, and I'm not going to. We're not going to talk about that. It's just that they they did break the record. They got the recognition for it, going under nine the first one, and now with the, with the training and the stuff that goes on, it seems like everyone's going under nine. You know, it's not it's not <laughs> one time it was like, you know, nine thirteen, but everyone's breaking nine thirteen. It's just if you're not breaking nine thirteen, don't come down there. If you're in an elite crew, you know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy what's going on. So We'll talk a little bit about that, too. I rode for four years, and I had some good guidance, and we got better over time. But we, our goal was to break 10, so <laughs> yeah. Yeah, straight, yeah. we were in a different category yeah. of that. So we were breaking 10 going around four kegs. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I heard a couple of crazy stories. So I'm pretty good friends with some of the powers up around this part. And I heard stories of you guys having – cement buckets in the basement with Mike Powers crew and strings on your head to keep your heads in line to train and some some things that were actually very grounded in theory that you might not have even known were real theory for training, but they're they're very applicable. You know, I'll always give Mike Powers the, the credit that he deserves when it comes to the training that went on with the uh, Royal St. John's Regatta. He took it to a new level and an early stage. He had the the know-how, the knack, the way to get things done, and it's so methodical, and he's still like it today. There was no such thing as a rowing machine or ergometers back then. So we used to have this one shock rowing machine, and it was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. And we, and we were just breaking them off hand over fist. I mean, every time I turn around, Mike was welding on another shock. But in his base, we set up a pulley system where you had to crawl in, lie down on your back, and then take this pulley system with a, it was in a, in a cylinder with weights into it, and then you sit down when you row that for 25 minutes. I think it was, I can't remember what it was. It was 25 or 30 minutes or 200 pulls, whatever you can come to first. And crawl back out again, and then it was just crazy. But, you know, the strength of the head, we did that in the boat. And Mike was trying to keep our head straight so he wouldn't turn. He wouldn't, you couldn't, you weren't allowed to turn your head. Oh, my God. And, you know, he had to wait down. Like, you know, your head is 25, 30 pounds. You move, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. It was like, it was just crazy. It was just, you know the stuff that we did. And, and this was all Mike Powers' thoughts. And then as if it all evolved, everybody started picking up on it and picking up what he'd done. And, you know, you got Bert Hickey down there now, probably got 17 or 18 championships, but it all evolved through Mike Power. There's no question yeah. about it. No, no one's going to make any different that. You mentioned something that was interesting. And before we get into like what the race is and what the format is, because it's a very unique race, but you said you almost get in shape, but it makes you in great shape. What are sort of the benefits that you guys would see physically as you would train throughout the season? So most people know me. I know I'm, I'm a fairly big guy, but I'm a big boned guy. I and mean, I've trained with you for a number of years. And I tend to lose weight when I work out hard and when I do a lot of training. And I've also played hockey in the wintertime. So what I found was when I started rowing at a good level, we'll say at an elite level, but I went away and played Quebec with the, with the Terra Novas, and I was in fantastic shape. It was all because of rowing. I rowed the year before that. I went away in 83, and I was the best person in shape on the team. I know I wasn't the best hockey player. I never said that, but I'm just saying <laughs> I was the best in shape because rowing got me in shape. Mm -hmm. And it's a different set of muscles. It's a different set of things that you do for hockey, but 
it does skip over it and your wind capacity and your leg strength. And so it's just as you found out that rowing is a sport where a lot of leg drive and a lot of shoulder pushes or pulls and stuff like that. But a lot of that's in hockey as well. You mm-hmm. know, and I found and then we found as the sport evolved, we found different sporting people used to come down, like soccer players used to come down and they tried they try rowing. Now found it how hard this rowing sport really is. You can't do a two summer sport when you're rowing at an elite level. It's just impossible. It's just so hard to do that. I found it good for my hockey career, for my hockey shape, because I, I was working out for rowing, but it was only a workout. I wasn't on the pond three times a day like we used to be. So now it's, you know, so that's the winter sport makes sense. The winter sport brought you into the rowing sport and vice versa. But if you try to play soccer and row at the same time, you don't have a leg stand like on five o'clock in the afternoon because you're just gone. You know, it, just, it just can't happen. Well, that's true. And you look at the sport like rowing, it's very unique. There's sports that are stop and go like a soccer that's 40 minutes long where you're running and stopping, running, stopping, rugby, for example, really hard sport. Then there's sports that are like 30 seconds long that are explosive. Even hockey, you play for a minute. Anybody rowing has to go to that pond in 10 or less minutes. <laughs> and then I was in a position one, so I had to roll the whole time around the, around the keg. So it was grueling from my perspective. And I played sports my whole life too. Yeah, you start to finish. There's no stopping. It's like you said, not everybody gets to row 859. Not everybody gets to row nine minutes. Whether you're rowing 10 minutes or 12 minutes or, or eight minutes, you're still doing something at a very high level, very high speed. And it's just a hard sport. And I'm not trying to discourage anybody because it's a great sport. You'll get get in great shape from this sport. We're here with Campbell Fien, record-setting rower, regatta committee member, and commentator of the races. We're talking all about the regatta, the oldest sporting event in North America, and this year's announcement that it'll be going ahead. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. We're here with Campbell Fien record-setting rower, regatta committee member, and commentator of the races. We're talking all about the Royal St. John's Regatta, the oldest sporting event in North America, and this year's announcement that it will be going ahead for the rowers. Let's get back to the interview. So let's get into some of the specifics, because if anybody's watching the Tokyo Olympics, they're going to see people rowing, and they may think it's the same thing, but it is not the same thing. Tell me about the boat, the race, and the positions, because there's all very specific to our race. The rowing shells in St. John's, and it's the only one that has fixed seat that I know for sure. I believe there was some talk about people over in Spain had had a fixed seat boat. But to my knowledge, we're the only one in North America that has a fixed seat. And a fixed seat is exactly what it sounds like. It's a fixed seat. It doesn't move. When I rowed in the, in the early 70s, 80s, and 90s, we had a, a sponge. We sat down in between the seat and, the, and our footings, and we rowed. The coxswain steered the boat, and he steers it with his, with his hands with a rope. He can't move. he got to look at the bank. he got to make sure he knows where he's going, give you a straight course. There's a turn. Now you got to turn this boat, which is 54 feet long, and approximately, someone's going to argue with me, but approximately 500-plus pounds on, on how large this boat is, plus seven men that are a buck 50 to 200. So there's a lot of weight in that boat that you're traveling and, you, and if you're, like I said, and it doesn't matter who you are, you've still got a good speed going to the boat. Now you're going to stop and go around the boy, hook the boy and go on again. Very difficult. And like you said, your road number one, you don't stop. You don't stop. So if it's 300 strokes, you're doing all 300. I'm doing 250 because I get the rest on the, on the gig. <clears throat> so like I said, a sliding seat is exactly what it is. It's all legs. It's all sliding seat. It's a tip of your boat. It's a lighter boat. You can take that boat, lift it, put it up in the car and go on home. Our boat, you ain't doing that. It ain't happening. There's, mm-hmm. there's, you know, we have pulley machines to get it in out the water. So, you know, the sliding seat is a total different animal. It's all legs. It's all, it's all, it's really, really tipsy. And, uh, you know, you can take them and flip them over pretty quick. Our boat, you're not, you're not turning them over very easy, I can tell you. It's very, it doesn't happen very often. That's right. And you said, okay, so we've alluded to a couple times the position. There's there's six positions plus a coxswain. So yes. where do they where do they sit in the boat and how do they row and what are their kind of roles? Walk me through those. The coxswain is, of course, you might look at it in the back of the boat. Then it's the six, which is the stroke, which is where I row to for most of my career. And then it staggers. It goes six, five, four, three, two, one. So the bow side got five, three, and one. The stroke side got six, four, and two. The stroke sets the pace. He'll set the pace of the boat, how, how fast the stroke is, when we're going to pick it up, when we're going to let it down. The, the, you and the coxswain have a very good relationship of where you're two on the pond. 
my number five for a lot of my career was Jared Ryan. And Jared was one of those rowers that looked straight ahead. He didn't he didn't move it up. He didn't he had his head straight ahead. He's looking at my shoulders. And I was kind of a person where I had to have I could obviously had to have to see my aura a little bit, so my head turned. So that created me to be able to see the other crowd. If we rode on one coming back, then I could see where we were two. And by the ladies' kegs coming in, Jared said, Where are we two? Where are we two? Where are we? He'd always wanted to know, and I can tell him where we were two. But um, so, and then he sets the pace on the bow side. So he'll, again, that's how it all works. It's all, it's all a team effort. I'll set the pace. If he's off with me, then we got a problem. But, you know, the five and six are very important people into the boat. And again, you know, what we used to call the powerhouse, the powerhouse are three and four. They're the ones that are really driving the engine to the boat and how powerful this boat is going to be. And you got two and one. And like I said, I wouldn't be one not for love nor money. <laughs> <laughs> I, know they gotta, I gotta turn that keg and I'm not going at it. Yeah. So, you know, and uh, you know, it is, it, that's just the way the setup is. And, and the, the sliding seats are similar, but they're actually opposite. So it, there's, there's, it's still a stroke and it's still bow, but they're actually the opposite of, if I remember correctly, number five is up front and it, it looks different than what ours is. So, yeah. and again, very, very different makeup. And you can have those sliding seats without coxswain. You can have with coxswain. You can just just fours, there's eights, there's one singles. Yeah, it's wild. And, and just a lot of races are won and lost on that turn, I'll tell you that. And people can line up wrong for them. There could be collisions. If you're a half a second behind and somebody makes that turn quick, you got to wait for them and there goes the race. I mean, it is critically challenging and that's such a unique element to that race. Well, there's lots of uh, funny stories to that. There's lots of sad stories to that. There's, um, but it's true what you said. There's a lot of races that have won and lost on that. So the coxswain, when he's at the top of the pond, generally has a has a marker at the bottom of the pond to to basically that's where he wants to turn. That you're gonna then he's it is a timing thing for him for when do I start my turn to go across the boy. But this one particular funny story was that I can't remember who the gentleman was. But I, I do remember, but I can't, I can't think of his name right now. He was looking at this marker and uh, the marker started moving and he couldn't figure out what the marker was doing. It was a cow. He, he picked up a cow. <laughs> I bet they didn't do too great. <laughs> <laughs> so, Amazing. So it, was, uh, it was a funny story for a lot of years. It's still going around, but it's a true story. I mean, he just picked it up and looked at it without what it was and, Again, I can't think who the coxswain was at the time, but that, that is a true story. Just you know, but you know, you tend not to try not to look at cows that's going to move on you. So yeah, oh yeah, yeah. No, I remember one race we we lost very badly because uh, our coxswain aimed towards the ladies' kegs, and uh, that was the wrong wrong buoy for us at Placentia. So it's yeah, just bad, it's just a bad coming back too, right? You got to turn, you got to come back on the right hand side of the, the boy, and if you go on the left side, you're you lose. You're just oh, that's. That's true too. Uh, at, the, at the finish, and there's lots of people on that number. A lot of the years, a lot of people went on the wrong side, and you know it's costly. It's a, you know, there's a lot of rules for the coxswain, not just yell and scream and get yourself going. You know. Well, and it's an exciting race because you can watch people take off and you can watch them finish, which is also unique to our race. So the good news is this year we're going to have a race. So tell me about this year's event, what people can expect, and how they can attend. Well, the um, <laughs> there's no attendance. The only way they're on attend this year is on um, is on the CBC or NTV or the the, the uh, Rogers. I didn't say CBC won't be there. I don't believe. So it, we're trying to really get people to go in on TV, watch this. Don't show up down to Regatta. We're trying to keep those people away. I'm sure we're going to have family members down there. So what I've got done, and I, I say, oh, it's the Regatta committee. We got a fence that's set up that only rowers allowed in on the wharf. And that's going to be set up right up to the wharf and the whole building's going to be covered in and going to be all the protocol for for, uh, for COVID that's going to be answered just like the are right now. It's the same thing, no different. Like tonight and we got today is no different. Only certain lot of people allowed in. But we're trying to keep the people away from the boathouse itself because you're just not going to be able to get in there and we don't want a big crowds coming around. Mm-hmm. Other than that, that's pretty well it. The regatta is the regatta. It's still going to be the same format. We're going to start off with uh, two in the morning, male and females, and we'll just keep the same format as we've always had in relation to the regatta. And except there's no uh, no concessions and no crowds gathering. What happens on the other side of the pond? We're, we're really hoping that it doesn't happen. But you know, we we spoke to public health. It's it, it will actually be the police problem if we have thirty thousand people. So, but we don't anticipate that to happen. So. 
That's good. And that's why it's important to get the word out now so people can tune in and they tune in. They're going to be hearing you because you're one of the broadcasters and commentators of the race. Yeah, well, I'm on with Bramador in the morning, so I don't stay all day. It's a long day. I, and this year is a bit different for me because I am a boat, a pond boathouse director, so I will have some other duties to do. But I'll be on with Brian for the most, you know, first four or five races in the morning and then probably in championship races for the, for the evening. So it's, uh, right. it's exciting times. We're back. Last year, we never had one. This year, we do. I know it's a very difficult decision to go without concessions. Uh, we know that it's part of the uh, process. The, our, our regatta is a package, and our package is concessionaires and rowers and teddy bears and french fries and people working out. But unfortunately, it's the time of year that we had, and the, the rowers really want to row. So we decided that this is going to be for the rowers. Uh, our understanding that the concessionaires were very well in tune with this, and they, you know, they thanked us for like, keeping them into, into the loop on this. And they agreed. They agreed that, you know, it's not a safe place right now, even though our numbers are down. Well, thanks, Campbell. That was really important information to know about how people can watch it online, but also how they can benefit from the sport. Any last words about people that have been like toying with the idea, maybe I'm going to try rowing. Like, me, what's your advice to them? It's really, you got to try it. You got to put it in your, in, your, in your head to say, I want to go try this sport out. It's not as bad as what it looks in relation to how hard it is. I didn't mean to put it out to that as like, this is impossible. It's not. We all started out at a very young age. It's a great sport to get to know people. It's a great sport for interacting with people. Uh, but it's also a great sport for getting yourself in shape for whatever winter programs you're doing. We have a learn to roll program now. Well, we have a we have a coxswain's course now. That if you want to just come down and be a coxswain and take people out, we have people doing, doing those coxswain courses now. Get online on our website. There's always crews in the website looking for a rower, a stroke, or just a group that just wants to start out and start a brand new crew. And it's a great way to, like I said, just to interact with, with people that, you know, even your own peers. You don't have to come down and meet someone new. Grab six of your buddies or six of your girlfriends and come on down. And it's a, it's a really challenging but really rewarding sport. It's great. Right. You'll enjoy it. All you got to do is get a footboard and the rest is free. So, you know, good, it's perfect. Yeah. So, well, thanks so much, Campbell. I'll look forward to seeing you in just a few weeks on TV hosting the regatta yet again. Yeah, well, great to see you, my buddy. And we'll see you soon, I'm sure. That was Campbell Fiend from the Royal St. John's Regatta Committee telling us everything we need to know about this year's event. When we get back, we'll talk with James and Dan Cadigan about their rowing careers and the record that James's crew set in 2007 that stands to this day. We'll be right back after this break. On August 1st, 2007, a crew that was sponsored by Crosby Industrial had their eye on setting a new record. They'd been working out and following a very regimented schedule that would whip them into shape. Two members of the crew and the coach for the community of Logie Bay, Middle Cove, and Outer Cove. That morning they were ready to go and by lunch they were the talk of the pond. They had broken the record and pride was restored to their community. No one ever thought that during the championship race they would once again break the morning record and bring double the pride and glory back to their community of Logie Bay, Middle Cove, and Outer Cove. With us today is James Cadigan, who was from that record-setting crew. He joined us with his brother, Dan, who's also an established rower in the community, and both helped me out when I learned how to row. They're gonna share their experiences and more about the sport and the Royal St. John's Regatta that will be going on this year. Let's check it out. Hey, James, hey, Dan, welcome to the show. Hey, great to be here, man. Hey, Mike. Great to see you guys. Now we're all neighbors up in this part of the world, and uh, that automatically makes me a better rower from what I've understood because we were talking to Campbell Fiend earlier. He's from this part of town. You guys just live up the road on Cadigan's Road, so there's obviously a lot of rowing in this community. You guys have been involved in the sport for a long time. Walk me through how you got involved in sort of a little bit of a, a short history on you and the sport. Yeah, so I guess I'll start it off. Uh, you know, I, I started rowing probably you know, early 2000s at the age of about 13, just, uh, of course, uh, following the footsteps of the uh, the Outer Cove greats, I guess the Bert Hickeys and Campbell Fiends and whatnot. And uh, so Bert coached myself and Brent Hickey, his son, and a group of fellows we had, Rowan Juvenile. And a couple of years later, I ended up uh, competing at Canada Game, coached by Paul Power and the team that he had put together. 
you know, that kind of paved the way for myself and Brent and a few of our age group to uh, start competing at a higher level. And so that's where we paved our way into Royal St. John's Regatta as senior rowers. And we had some great successes, but we put in a lot of work. And to this day, you know, rowing is something that is a big part of my life. And I always cherish the days down around the lake. Yeah, my side of it, I guess I was, you know, down here, I guess when you come of age to row, you kind of got to go down and try it at least once, right? So if you don't, I don't think, you know, you're, you're considered loud, loud back in the community. But uh, no, uh, we, I, same thing. I had a bunch of my buddies. We went down, I think we rode under custom cabinets at the time. And then, uh, you know, as it went on, some people just got away from it a little bit. And that's when, at that time, is when James and them started rowing with Crosby's. And, and uh, it was around 06, 07, my last couple of years of high school, when I started getting, you know, more and more into it, watching them roll and seeing what they were doing and just seeing, you know, how exciting it was to be a part of that whole, that whole foundation down there in the community around Kitty Bitty Lake. And it just hooked me. And then, uh, you know, after a couple of years when I grew up and got a little bit bigger and they uh, let me get in the boat with them and uh, took off from there. And again, same thing. I mean, it becomes a bit of a, a bit of an addiction for us. It was just so much work and time and everything that we, we put in. I mean, we love doing it, but our families too, but you know, it just, uh, Again, like you just remember everything. I remember just about every race I was in. Every I can tell you, you know how the turn was, and it just becomes like such a such a memory that you hold on to, and everything that you've done down there, who you met, and who's down there, and who's going to keep going. And then you see new people coming in, you get involved with them and help them out, and you know just trying to keep it moving, right? It's true. It's true. I mean, and I rode with you guys when I was first learning to row and there were some really memorable races for us, even beating certain time things. Like we first broke 10 minutes, which for you guys would be nothing, but for us, it was a huge accomplishment. Now you were part of the last crew that holds the record down in the pond. Tell me about that experience. So that would have been the Crosby industrial services crew. You know, that was the crew that we rode together in 2006, Regatta and 2007. And you know, it was a group of unexpected uh, kind of collaboration, really, because you had three uh, fellows who were in their 30s. And then you had myself, Brent, and Adam Cavanaugh, who were, you know, the age of, between the age of 18 and 20, kind of pulled together by Bert Hickey and Mike Power. And it just came down to the fact that we all were hungry and, and willing to put the work in and were driven to stop at, stop at nothing to achieve our goals. And that was one thing that... You know, uh, it is very common with a lot of successful crews that, you know, everybody's on the same page. Everybody puts in the same amount of work. You know, you're going to see positive outcomes in that case. Agreed. And it's a process throughout the whole season. So walk me through how the season starts because you get in the pond and it's so early in the year, your hands are frozen. There's a bunch of races that get you to the regatta finally. Yeah, for us, a lot of times it starts around Christmas time, maybe around Boxing yeah. Day when we all get together, you know, yeah. and have a have a good time and stuff like that. And we get chatting, okay, who's going back, who wants to roll and stuff. And, and you know, we kind of take it on. So usually around the first or second week of January, we kind of start our programs and yeah. uh, determine what we're going to do when we're going to roll and, and set your goals, realistic. You got to set, you know, a realistic goal and then a desired goal and then a uh, perfect goal. You chip away at it best you can. And and hopefully as, as the year goes, you, you start getting to those, different spaces you want to be, different times you want to hit and stuff like that. So, you know, and then you get to discovery day, like you said, the first race and see what your time is there, how you rolled the conditions and see how you did. And then, you know, did you meet that goal? Okay, well, you exceeded it. Now what? Now you push yourself a little bit further. So I think our mindset is just like James said. I mean, you just got to be willing to give it all in, right? And not not, kind of go through the wall and and, uh, just empty it every single time that you go to the train, just so you know you can get there. The harder you go now, then the harder you know you can go when you're, when you're over yet a day kind of thing. So I think that was our mentality through our years and definitely James would say the same. You just got to be willing to go there. Well, that's right. And and so James, people may know you were doing radio right now, but they would recognize you if they were watching the news before because you do a lot of the public relations for the RNC. Think about how it helps with your physical fitness. Is that one of the benefits of it for people? Is that it's an amazing form of exercise? Yeah, you know what? I I can speak for myself that I I feel my best when uh, I'm training for rowing. It's good to cardio. It's it's strength. It's it's, it's a bit of everything. And, uh, you know, not only that, but it also builds your mental strength because it, it's a sport that uh, pushes hard as you want to push and that that's that's your limit you know what i mean so you can always search for that little bit more every time and uh you know it, it's a very much a mental a mental uh, strength builder as well and uh, you talk about the good values that are built around rowing i mean 
teamwork. You've got six people who are sitting there and just emptying the tank there with you. So think about the fact that these people are on the same page. They have faith in each other and they spend so much time together that the teamwork that's built there is unparalleled. And you, you have a, a coxswain in the boat who's putting in just as much time, you know, and spending just as much time at the lake. And uh, so this group of people who end up rowing even for one season together, the work ethic that's built there is, is uh, something that you'll always remember. Well, that's super important for kids. And, I, I, you know, I'm thinking from the mental health side of things, too. The social interaction is great. It's one of those sports where the best can, they can hang out with the worst. I know I've had some of you guys spare on our team when we rode. But I also think about from the mental health side of things as well. There's been lots of beautiful mornings and beautiful evenings watching the sun go down in the lake. What are some other benefits, Dan, that you, you sort of have seen from it outside of just the physicality of the sport? Yeah, Mike, you hit it on the nail. You hit it on the head there. Because, like, we're not rolling this year. We took a year away, kind of given the circumstances of what's going on in the world. I mean, you know, it's uh, hard to ask our families to let us go down and do it again, right? But, but I went down there a couple of times. It was a beautiful evening. The pond was flat. There was crews. I could hear the water going. The boat's coming by me. And just, like, I just sat there. I think I was there for, like, an hour and a half. Didn't even realize it. Just, like, just that peace, you know? And, like, I, I remember the times when, like, you get in the boat and you're, you just start clicking, you take off, you get down towards the end of the pond, you just feel the wind at the back of your head. Like, it's just something about it for us that we love it and we do it for that purpose just because we love it. But, like, you get off the, off the pond after a bit of hard work and, like, you know, like James said, the teamwork side of it. And then, like, your families are down there, you got some friends down there, and it's just, like, there's nothing like it. And you go home at the end of the day and, like, you, you know, you, you, you're laughing and joking about what went on and you just feel a sense of accomplishment, you know, because you're training hard for a certain thing and then you hit, might have hit it that day. It's uh, it's it's definitely something like uh, there's never a time when I leave and my mind is not clear. You know, I just like James said, I, I feel my best when I'm rolling and I feel my best mentally. I feel my best physically. There's nothing like it training and physically. And honestly, like being out on the water like that, you know, people people pay to do that for vacation, go out and, and get in a canoe and roll around or whatever. Right. So, you know, it just speaks for speaks volumes of, of and the community that is down there. You know? Yeah. And I think that uh, in addition to that, I mean, you, you look at what goes on around you in, in the rowing world. I mean, you're outdoors uh, in fresh air. You're getting some sun. I mean, you're hearing that water, all very positive and just such a valuable uh, sport to mental health in general, I think. You're so present when you're out there, you're paying attention to every stroke, you're counting it all, you're waiting for the person in front of you, you're 100% folks, you can't be thinking about anything else, you're just thinking about keeping yeah. your hands level and, and uh, making sure you're pulling the right leg, it's, just, it's a beautiful thing, it's very forced meditation, I think, and that might be good say, for certain people, for me it's good because I need something to keep my mind occupied and that's a good one. I was going to say that if you're thinking about something else, I think someone's going to give you a, a good ball and out. Yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. You'll find out pretty quick if you're thinking about something else because your water might end up in a body kidney lake or something, right? We're here with the Cadigan boys, Dan and James from Logie Bay, who are sharing everything we need to know about the sport of rowing and the upcoming Royal St. John's Regatta this year. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back. We're here with the Cadigan boys, Dan and James from Logie Bay, who are sharing everything we need to know about the sport of rowing and the upcoming Royal St. John's Regatta this year. Let's get back to the interview. Let's take this opportunity to bring it down a level for folks that may be a little bit intimidated. I mean, we've had Campbell Fien on today. Have you guys on today? All very experienced rowers. But people that are starting out, you guys had to start out. You weren't great the second you, you got in the water. What do people experience when they go through? What's the process when somebody goes to learn so that if they go through it and they feel a little bit uneasy, like they're not that great, like that they might actually be on track because everybody goes through it? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when you're starting to learn how to row, when you're, when you're just getting used to getting in the boat alone, I mean, you want to get comfortable. You want to learn how to be comfortable and just learn the mechanics. So, I mean, let's not think about, you know, really – pulling the side off the boat here. The power is not the most important thing in the early stages of learning to row. The important part is the technique and, and the mechanics. And uh, it's from there, once you're able to row clean and, and efficient, that's where you can start adding that power and see results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, and something else that I think is really important is that a lot of people like to have a goal when it comes to their fitness. 
Now I'm looking at you guys right now. You're in your own home gym with a rower behind you and your weights there. And for somebody who's looking at having a goal and something that holds them accountable, you've got a team to keep them accountable and you've got a date where people are going to be watching you, you know, either on TV or around the pond and you want to perform. And Dan, what's the, what's the benefit of that sort of process to keep people in line? Because most people just give up on exercise. That's why they don't participate. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, it, you're definitely right there. It just gives you something like you got, that's one thing that we found is like, you know, there's days that we're training when you just like, you might not have it, right? You know, you, I mean, everyone feels it. It's like, oh, I don't know if I can do this today. But the reality is you got five other people, six, seven, sometimes with your coaches or whatever that are just there waiting by pond side for you to get there. So there's no other option, but to go down and row. And then when you do and get there, like everyone knows how good you feel when you didn't have it that day, but you still went and did it anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, because that just, it, it, you break your mind, right? Your mind, your mind starts getting there and be like, yeah, I didn't have it yesterday, but I did it. So I can always do it. That's one thing that we always say about rowing is like, yeah, you, you break your mind before you break your body with rowing because you, you challenge yourself mentally more than you do physically because that simple fact that like, you might not want to do it, but everyone's going to hold you accountable and everyone's waiting for you and everyone else is there. So, you know, it, it's a very important aspect of, again, it goes right back to teamwork and just like crowd camaraderie and all the, you know, the values that you build up being a part of a of the rowing community and a rowing team in the, you know, down three guy. Yeah. And, and you know, it's funny, the sport kind of hands you a little bone once in a while. I remember there was a couple of times you used to make me really excited each year when they would change the oars and then they would change the boats and everything got a little easier. <laughs> Do you guys remember days like that? Oh yeah. I remember seeing those nice oars coming out and uh, it's almost like a nice early birthday gift. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It makes it a little better. So this year folks have been able to participate and they're not going to be going down the regatta. They'll be watching it on TV. Do you guys know many of the folks that are, are, are competing or at least uh, training this year and what's their experience been like this year versus previous years? Yeah. I mean, uh, I know there's a couple of crews myself and James have been down rowing with a couple of crews, just, just trying to get in, you know, you, you can get away from it if you want, but you're never really away from it, yeah. you know? So uh, we like to go down and, and get in the boats and it's a good opportunity for us too, like you said, uh, just to try and see if we can help out or you just maybe a crew might be struggling with something and based on James's experience and, and it might be able to just give them one little tip that might make the boat move a little bit quicker. Right. So if you can do that for a crew, it just might keep them a bit motivated and keep them around longer. And, you know, maybe next year they'll go back at it. So uh, I know that a lot of people are still excited about it. And still, again, the goal of Brigada Day is still there for a lot of these crews that, that are participating and, and training. So it's great that the Brigada is going off. So that's a positive there. And, uh, and I'm, I'm happy for all the crews that have been training that do get the opportunity to take part in the Brigada. Mm-hmm. James, if somebody is going to be thinking about taking up the sport, you know, what's your advice to them? How do they get started? Yeah, you know what? Uh, I think you mentioned it earlier, but the Regatta, St. John's Regatta, the rowing community is very much that a community and uh, they're very accessible and uh, you can contact and, and communicate with them and, and learn more about how you can get into uh, join a crew or just to learn how to row. And uh, not only that, but there's a lot of great people down there rowing uh, on a daily basis who are just ready to help. Uh, you know, I, I certainly can speak for our group and uh, we, we want to see success down there for everybody. The stronger the rowing community is down there, the stronger the competition, you know, the better the event as a whole. And, uh, you know, we want to see everybody you know, see success and improvements and, and reach their goals. I think there's more than enough people down there who want the same. And to start off, you know, there's Facebook group uh, you can get in contact with. There's also just simply contacting the boathouse uh, staff down there. And uh, from there, you know, you'll, you'll be surprised at how quickly things can take off. That's awesome. And just a bit of hope for everybody listening. We came sixth one year, which was first in our race, and we got a big, huge trophy. And the people that came fifth in the first race, they didn't get a trophy. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> Everybody thought we won the regatta when I had the, uh, the trophy on. So, hey, go for, go for first, sixth, or 11th. You know, you'd be all set. <laughs> yeah, you want to be the first uh, in the group of five, for sure. Yeah. Again, like talking about the rowing community down there, like I see so much camaraderie down around the lake. And it's, it's you know, between crews of all ages, you know. So down at the lake, you've got such a broad opportunity of, uh, you know, leadership, uh, coaching, uh, for example, you've got persons down there with over 50 years of experience, Cox and a crew of 12 year olds who are just going down and learning how to row. So you've got history there. You've got experience and just simple know-how guiding the way for our next generation. And I can tell you that that is no different than 
what you'll see on a daily basis down there in terms of the camaraderie and, and the partnerships that are down there. Uh, you know, I can speak for our group and we want to see, we want to see success. We want to see people reaching their goals and we want to see the sport built and, and strengthened for the future. Yeah. So like the, the good part about it is we can have someone like myself and James go down to the pond and just see a crew just starting and just chat with someone who, you know, is coxing in them and have no issue. And just like, you know, just, they might say, yeah, do you, do you see anything? And we can just say, oh yeah, you might be able to do this or do that. And it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what you're doing. See, if everyone's down to the pond, everyone has the same goals. Everyone just wants everyone to be successful and do well and enjoy it, you know, because if people are out there not enjoying it, they're not going to want to come back. So the easier we can make it or the community can make it for these rowing crews, these rowers to be out there and enjoy it. And that's, our, that's the goal, just to make people want to be there, want to enjoy it, want to have fun, enjoy their time around Kitty Bitty Lake and grow the sport even more. Mm -hmm. I was, was going to say, well, I mean, that's how we all met. We all became friends because I was down there for four years. And over those four years, spent a lot of time together. I remember you guys jumping in boats and, and, and helping out. And uh, it made a big difference. It made our experience better because we improved a lot. And, uh, and then, then we became people who were given a bit of advice here and there. Not that much, mind you, but we had some. <laughs> no, no. You know, when you look at the past couple of years and, and where we are today with the regatta going ahead uh, in early August, you know, you really want to recognize uh, the work of the committee and, uh, and you want to recognize the work of the crews uh, that are going to compete this year. And a big kudos to all of those groups. Uh, you know, it certainly was great for me to go down to the pond and see boats on the pond this year, uh, even though I wasn't in one. Uh, but uh, I really want to recognize the commitment of all these stakeholders and, and, and volunteers uh, and certainly the sponsors who are going to make this happen this year. That's excellent. That's excellent. It's great to have ambassadors like you guys as well. They're so dedicated to the sport and so willing to have a conversation. So I really appreciate it, fellas. Oh, well, we're happy, happy to uh, be involved. Man. Bring on next year. Yeah. <laughs> All right, exactly. I'll be cheering you on in person. Thanks. Oh, Thanks, Thanks Mike. Thanks to my guests, Campbell Fien and Dan and James Cadigan for sharing their stories with me today. I wish all the crews luck in this year's races, and I'm looking forward to tuning into all the action. Now, if you want to learn more about how you can get involved in the sport, you can visit stjohnsregatta.ca and learn all about registering a team in the Learn to Row program. I hope we see you out in the pond. Well, that's our show this week. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. We'll see you back here next week for another episode of the Wellness and Healthy Lifestyle Show on your VOCM.